podcast is part of the Sports Social Podcast Network. Close your eyes. It's time to discover what starting and growing your own business feels like. Whether your business is bed sheets or skincare, Shopify is with you every step of the way. Now, open your eyes. This is Possibility, powered by Shopify. Sign up for a free trial at shopify.com slash offer 22. Shopify.com slash offer 22. You made it. Here. Finally. Checked out of office to check into the sweet views of that place you've always wanted to go. You know the one. It's nice. Even the kids like it. This place is so cool. And they never like it. Mom, can we go to the pool? Look at that. Not even asking for the Wi-Fi. When you're with Amex, it's not if it's going to happen, but when. American Express. Don't live life without it. Welcome back to the Love Tennis Podcast with me, James Gray of inews.co.uk and the iNewspaper. As always, I've got George Belshaw, tennis writer, and our resident tennis coach, Calvin Beton, who is officially the Love Tennis Podcast Coach of the Year. That's one award we don't have to talk about. Uh, We have already chosen him as our Coach of the Year. Calvin, how are you? You must be very excited that... George and I have nominated and, in fact, awarded you that. that it's yeah, accolade. it's 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 probably the biggest and only coach of the year award I've ever won. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> over the moon about it. Uh, Congratulations, yeah. nevertheless. Uh, George, how how are you? You've had a, a a day of trains and travel. Yeah, um, it was a bit of a funny day because the train I booked the two before it had been cancelled on the way back about three hours before. So I was like texting you guys like. Yeah, I'm not sure I'm going to make it back in time for this, but mine was fine. It was good. It's been a lovely time in Leeds. Um, I've not won any awards like Calvin, unfortunately. <laughs> this week. But I was leaving my current uh, role today to start something new next week. So, Are I... you allowed to officially confirm what that new role is, or is it so boring that we're actually going to lose listeners? Possibly the latter, but yeah, I'm shifting... <laughs> Shifting within health policy to quite a high profile thing, so I'll leave it at that. A high profile thing, I'll leave it at that. I'll leave it at that. Well, it's good to hear exciting developments afoot. Uh, so we await with interest to see exactly which cabinet position George is being promoted to. Of course, in modern Britain, everyone gets a cabinet position at some point, so it'll come to us all. Uh, I'll be on I'm with Celeb in a few weeks, I think. <laughs> I did I did say I was on the phone to someone at a, a government department today that shall remain nameless and I said well last time we this happened so and so was Secretary of State and now it's someone different and you know only one more Secretary of State till Christmas um, so that is kind of what they say in departments I hear now anyway um, we've got quite a lot of tennis to talk about which is sort of the point although increasingly less and less um, we're going to talk about Nick Boliteri and uh, his uh, legacy in tennis, of course, after the sad news of his passing. Uh, the LTA have been fined $1 million. Uh, that's um, a reference that a very specific generation of people in the UK will get. Uh, the Hotman Cup is back, uh, for better or for worse, or, well, for worse. Uh, Calvin has gone viral. That's big news around here. Fernando Vadasco has got a slightly less busy winter than he might have anticipated. And we're also going to start thinking about awards season, which Calvin has so conveniently kicked off for us. But I wanted to start with Nick Bolletieri. Uh, it's the first time that we've recorded since uh, the news of his death. Uh, he died in Florida at the age of 91. He's one of the most famous tennis coaches of the modern era. His name is known just about everywhere tennis is known. Um, he has worked with, and this list I put together, I can scarcely believe it, uh, players he's either worked with as a travelling coach or, or at the academy. Andre Agassi, Jim Courier, Monica Sellers, Mary Pierce, Maria Sharapova, Danny Hajakova, Yelena Jankovic, Nicole Vadasova, Sabine Lizicki, Sarah Arani, Tommy Haas, Max Murney, Xavier Melis, Venus Williams, Serena Williams, Martina Hingis, Anna Kornikova, Marcelo Rios and Kay Nishikori. Um, 
there are two. Uh, uh, George, I'm not mentioning the other one. I'm not. Men- I'm not mentioning. <laughs> I George really was Bellshaw. hoping you're going to tag the last one on. <laughs> Uh, as like great banter for the pod we but. shall come in <laughs> on to George's uh, session singular with Nick Bolateri. Um there are too many tributes to, to read them all you know so many players my Instagram stories were just full of players with each of whom had their own unique stories I, I kind of liked Tommy Hass's most of all just because it was quite simple he said you were a dreamer and a doer and a pioneer in our sport truly one of a kind I just like that phrase a dreamer and a doer because so many people are one or the other and to be both is pretty rare um calvin as i say he's a a name that everyone who knows tennis reasonably well knows probably one of the most famous or well-known coaches at least um of our time what what legacy does he leave behind um yeah i'd say up until maybe the last 10 years he's probably the most famous tennis coach uh, of all time um obviously he's he was 92 so he'd faded out a little bit he wasn't on uh, on screen as much, but um, yeah, his legacy would be um, he, he's a pioneer in that he basically invented the tennis or sports academy as we know it today. There was not, none of that type of thing before he came up with the idea of basically getting a load of kids and elite level players training in one place uh, and charging a lot of money for it. Um, and you know, he was the first one and now there must be 200 of them in America alone. They're all over Spain. That's his legacy. Um, so a pioneer, uh, in that respect, a, uh, a groundbreaker in that respect as a tennis coach, um, I, I, I'd say a bit of a non-entity as far as I'm aware. Um, although what I will say, I've spoke to a couple of players who have, spent time with him and they'd said that his motivational abilities were phenomenal um, when he was on court with you but in terms of actual info that he gave as a tennis coach uh, there wasn't huge amounts it's interesting really because you know one of the things that what doesn't set him apart from most tennis coaches but one of the things people often talk about is that he wasn't a player of any particular note I think he didn't play really to a high level he he dropped out of university and started coaching tennis as almost as something to do um but obviously became very successful at it um i mean i suppose there is room for both types of coach calvin obviously you want someone who can do the technical stuff but you know a motivator is just as important in some ways yeah i think as well i mean what when when we we go through this again of I spoke about it many times before, this idea of working a coach when he's coached and he's worked with a player. That's different from having actually coached them and having improved them. Hmm. Um, And Nick was very sort of renowned for, I mean, his academy was just, there's two ways of looking at his academy. There's a lot of players you've just listed, uh, James. There's a lot of players came out of that academy to be top players in the world. When you look at how many players went into the academy to get maybe 20 out, it's a hell of a lot to, um, you know, the, the percentage of, of actual, you know, the amount of money that's been spent on that place. It was a lot. But basically what, what he was renowned for was that when a player started getting good at his academy, he suddenly started appearing on court with them and, and in the box and that kind of thing. Um, if Agassi was his main one, famously, although Courier was training there at the same time, but Agassi was the main, his first one. And then they had a big fallout. I think Agassi actually called him a con man, as far as I can remember. Um, which and... which particular version of Andre Agassi was this? Like how much <laughs> meth was in that his would system? Have been... No, that would have been... He was with him when he won Wimbledon. Uh, so he was with him in 92, I think, when Agassi won Wimbledon. They broke up in 93. Yeah, following Wimbledon in 93. Yeah, and then he started coaching Becker. And Becker was the first person he coached who actually wasn't at the academy. It was the first mm-hmm. time he'd stepped out. Um I think they had moderate success. I think it was at the end of, I mean, we talk, I say it was the end of Becker's career, but in 80, in 93, he'd still only been about 24 or something. <laughs> but um, he came through so young. But um, um, yeah, but he, um, yeah, there was a lot of players there. You know, there's a lot of players, especially around that time. I guess it's more because it's my era. And, you know, there was Agassi and Courier, obviously, but there were there were other players there around at the time. There was Ben Sh- um Brian Shelton was there, who's actually Ben Shelton's dad. He mm. was one of the... Um, David Wheaton was there, who beat Agassi the year before he won it at Wimbledon. There were all these sort of American guys who 
famously trained at the Bolletieri Academy. But as far as I'm aware, though, that, that I mean, that really did produce a lot. But then I was told the other day by somebody that basically then IMG bought the academy uh, and just kept Nick there for the branding and kept the name of it and everything. And apparently after that happened, it's, it's really gone downhill as an actual training base for, for tennis players. It's very much about marketing now and that kind of thing. I was told that in the early days, it was a, re- a very, very tough school Um in terms of somewhere to go and train and the players were you know it, it was no cakewalk down there um and it was it kept very competitive apparently they, they had a what they called an a group and a b group um and the, the whole academy was split into two and there was at the end of the week there was basically a day of match play and and two players got promoted and two players got demoted from each one and if you were in the a group you were treated a whole lot better than you were in the b group i think Maria Sharapova called it a prison <laughs> of sorts, a tennis prison, um, to kind of sum up their competitiveness. Um, George, how competitive was your one session on court <laughs> with Nick Bolletieri? Well, well, I should clarify that I spent a week at the academy, but had a, an early morning session just with Nick. So the just a bit of context, my coach in Birmingham, he, he trained at Bolletieri. So he he was quite a young hotshot from kind of a uh, France or a French speaking region in Europe, and um, he famously <laughs> France that, or a French speaking. I can't remember region. exactly where he's from. He's got like a few, I think Bahrain and French kind of crossover sort of. Right. Thing. Okay. I can't remember where he's from. Sorry, that was a bit weird. Weird way of phrasing. I don't remember where the other one was. I love it. Um, but he so he trained there when he was young. He he. He actually pulled away because of financial stuff, but he was like beating Marty Fish as kind of a young junior and he was quite talented and used to... So he took on a role at our the other club I started playing at when I was about 16, 17, and he was arranging these trips um, for kind of school kids. Or so I, I actually went just 18, 19, I think, um, to the academy. We had a week there. As Calvin says, actually, we were split into groups, which I'm not sure... You know, we weren't obviously like top ranked tennis players. It was like a you know a kind of week sort of camp sort of thing. But you, they had one group of nationally ranked American players sort of thing or European top ranked players, and then there was a a B group. And I, I was in the B group, but I, I came I came third in the B group tournament, much to the disdain of some of the players who were there, who were clearly much better at tennis than me. But I just could play some quite wind up tennis, like a sort of. Jose Mourinho slash Tony Pulis tennis to right okay shithouse tennis shithouse tennis yeah which uh, astonished people I won a pair of Nick Bolletieri shorts or IMG you still got them I've I've lost them and I'm, I'm very disappointed <laughs> I don't know where they are because I, I was, absolutely I'm few stick them on Twitter at some point I'm sure they'll be in my parents home somewhere but I've never found them but anyway um so we actually had an as part of our trip there Arnie who's, who's the coach he he saw Nick there and they were in a bit of a chat and he was like, would you mind arranging a session? Do you have any time this week? And the only slot he had was at six in the morning. Ugh. So we all trooped down there at six o'clock for a six to seven lesson with Nick Politeri. And, you know, it, it, there's obviously very different levels to tennis coaching. So the one thing that was very clear was just his passion for everything. Like he was obviously still quite an old man there. Like he's died at 91 today. I'd have been there 10 years ago. So, you know, he's still trotting around in his late seventies, early eighties on court, kind of marching around, like you've got to do this, this and this, let's go, let's go, let's go. It was like very, you know, it was someone you could tell absolutely loved what they were doing, um, which did kind of stick with me at the time. Did make a few technical adjustments to be fair, but as Calvin, if you ever saw me play, will know there are many technical adjustments I just refused to make, even though I need. <laughs> No, they need to be done at some stage. You know, so, they say some players are coachable. George is uncoachable. <laughs> yeah, some just refuse, you know. It's just the <laughs> flat out talent I turn out with. I refuse to put any work into ironing out the kinks, etc. But um, yeah, it was a lot of fun. And, you know, the academy as a whole, I think as a, a complete kind of novice going out there, you really enjoy it because, you know, we don't have nice sunny academies there. We don't mm. have, you know, this kind of American style of like, um, there were some of his, I was going to call them underlings, but you know, like other coaches who were kind of running around, running in the camps. They, they would call me six nine and say I was serving out of a tree, and you know, shout at me while I was running around a big lake there, etc. It was, you know, it, it it was a lot of fun, and you know, I think that's probably more the legacy, the kind of 
the vibe around it. But um, yeah, he he was a really. I only spent an hour with him, but he was a lot of fun. Very interesting guy, and yeah, I I I liked him in the short period I spent with him, even if I was a an impressionable late teen. I think we can't, and I know I've said it already, but we can't understate just the idea that he basically invented the academy. And it always cracks me up now when I see around Britain when you know you see it here that somebody else so and so set up a new academy. And it's like, no, they're, they're not academies. They're just things that they're coaching programs that are run at a club that's already there. An academy is actual a new training center that has been built, purpose built to house the training of tennis players. Or, and in America, you get it now, there's basketball academies, there's soccer academies, there's uh, football academy, uh, American football academies. There were none of those before, before Nick Baltieri. And he, he invented it. Look at Spain with. How many people you now see going to academies in Spain? Um, and, and to be fair as well, Bolotieri still remains 30, 35 years on. The only one of these academies that has actually produced a tennis player. Uh, when you think, yeah, some of the others can claim they have, but they've basically, what they've done is they've basically gone and got the best juniors from around the world and invited them into their academy when they were already good. Bolotieri's is the only one still that that was for a, a period having players come out of it. I mean, I, I suppose it, it, the, the question is what age does someone have to like join an academy for you to produce them? Like Alcaraz didn't go to Equalite until I think 13. Um, you know, uh, Murray, I'm just picking examples yeah. I can think of where I know the age. Murray went to Sanchez um, at the age of what, 14 maybe? Um, I mean, how young? I don't think how it's young... age, though, James. I don't necessarily think it's age. I think it's more of to what what level you are at that age. Hmm. So if you go at fourteen and you're already the best player in Europe, and you start training there, I don't think that academy can then take the credit for producing this player. Hmm. Um, but I think if say you go at if you go at fourteen and you're, you know, you know, like say you're Yannick Sinner, for example. He wasn't doing anything at 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. And then he starts working with Piatti. And, you know, then he's like, well, he started working with Piatti at 16. And then now he's a top 10 player. You can go, yeah, that guy has produced a player in inverted commas. And I think mm. that's the way I always look at it. It's not, but they come around at different ages and that kind of thing. But I guess it's diff It's also different now. I remember this years ago. There was, you know, you hear about things now with it. It's just because of the internet. You hear about tennis players now you know you hear about if there's a phenom you just see about them more and i remember there was a, a documentary on Bolotieri's academy it would have been in the i'm gonna say in the mid to late 90s probably the 97 98 sort of time um maybe a bit earlier um and they went behind the scenes and there was this they said that you know they were talking about who the best prospect at the academy was um and it was tommy Haas, and at the time, no one had ever heard of him. It was this German guy. And remember, they just kept saying about this guy's got the best single-handed backhand we've ever seen. Um, and no one had ever heard of him. And then, obviously, he went on to become world number two. Probably some people say he's the best player that's never been to world number one in the world. Um, and, um, and you know, so that, you know, so, but we don't know. I don't know how good Tommy Haas was before he went to Bolletieri's Academy. I remember that video showed him he was about 16. Um, but, you know, he might have been the best player in Germany at the time and they just went and, and snapped him up. Yeah, I guess that's a really hard thing to track, isn't it? Like, at what stage someone, like, shoots off into brilliance. I, I was gonna... <laughs> the, the the funny thing I remember, well, not funny, but just I remember the player who was training there at the time and one of the dads who'd come along, so it was like a kind of kids and a couple of parents sort of came along on this thing. And one of the dads had been walking around one day and was like, I've just seen the next big thing. I've just seen him. It was unbelievable. I can't see. I can't tell you how well this guy was hitting the ball. This guy, I'm certain, is going to be world number one. His uh, his brother's already a pretty good player, but this guy's really going to make it. Do you want, do you want to have a hazard of guess who that is? I mean, presumably, it's someone who did at least partially make. So it. Both of them are tennis playing brothers. I would say um... like start. that was a bit of a clue. So there was a, an older brother. And the younger one was like trade. It's gonna be then, right? Nah, because George is quite a lot older than Zverev. Um, oh, sorry, yeah. Uh, so, is it someone your age, George? I think he was possibly 
fractionally I, I can check the age now but i imagine he was like slightly younger than me by like a few years got an older brother playing oh but he's 28 so yeah he's two years younger than me that would have been like 18 19 then he was like 16 Ah, oh, this is bad. No, I don't know. Tell us. Yeah, not great. On. Not great for a recorded podcast. This is it. Not great for <laughs> <laughs> just uh, me and James just stood here stroking our chins. <laughs> well, I think it's quite. It's more quite an amusing answer. It was Christian Harrison. Okay. Ah, so that's again the person I remember being there at the time. Not the, even the second best dad. player in his family. Yeah, exactly. So it went wrong since then. They clearly saw me at the academy, put the efforts into me that week. I think all. that's that's though something that you see a lot, and you know when you go to these academies or or anywhere, you know, and you hear people going, "Oh, this is I've seen this player, and it's, it's going to be the best player ever." So there's no bigger mistake made in in observing tennis players than judging them purely on ball striking. Yeah, it, it, it accounts for probably about twenty percent of what is required. And, and just to say, this was a you know. A, com a completely uh, un uninitiated sounds a bit harsh, but you know they, they didn't have like a big technical iron of it. They were just like watching someone and be like, "Oh my god, how good's this guy? He's going to be absolutely amazing." I mean, I think that is, I think that is like also, and it's why I often say to people about watching tennis live, like tennis players are really good at it. Like people who train tennis regularly, they're really good at it. And like if you go and watch the world number a thousand and the world number one courtside and you've never really watched anyone play tennis at high level before they will both look really good <laughs> two things i saw this week that just reminded me just of what you were saying james and it was what one of them was the um everyone will have seen it that video of jack Grealish and phil fodden doing a few kick-ups and then <laughs> kicking the ball and everyone going oh this is amazing so have you never seen decent footballers do it like, like i mean it's not that what they're doing isn't that hard like they're basically chesting a ball doing a few kick-ups then kicking the ball back to each other across maybe 20, 20 metres. And, like, you know, I know good Sunday league players who can do that, like, without any problem. Um, Are they as sexy as Grealish, Kelvin? Well, no, but then there's <laughs> the other thing. Like, similar to that, like, I see one... Uh, there's a video, and I, I don't even know if I find it, and they'll go, look at the finesse on Federer here. And it's basically someone hits a ball to him, and he's talking to his coach, and the ball comes into him, and he's not expecting it. So, oh, he's expecting it, but he, he kind of stops it, and he, like, back spins it back into his hand. And it's like, I can do that. That's not that hard. You know, it's just back spinning a ball. It's funny you say you mentioned Federer there, because I think Federer is the ultimate person. You watch live and you're like slightly mesmerized if you don't know yeah. like how easy some things are. Like you just kind of he flicks the ball perfectly, it's like ball boys and stuff, and you just watch it like, oh my god, how the hell's he done? It's like it's really not that hard. Whereas like someone like Novak to a degree probably looks like more industrious yeah. in what he's doing but I always think like the length of Novak's ball and where he's pushing it is more impressive than actually the flair of a Federer it's yeah but the Federer like, the Federer one... like the Shapovalov jumping backhand I do have like that kind of appreciation of the art of the, the Federer hitting the ball to ball kids is another great fallacy it's like again I, I'd feel pretty confident that I could do that <laughs> 48 times out of 50. Like, you know, it's not that difficult. You can difficult. test this at some point. Me and James will be your ball kids. <laughs> well, yeah, but it's like, you know, I, I, I've, you know, there are certain things that tennis players do you think that's unbelievable and say with footballers, but those things that I've mentioned, they're, they're not at the, they're not at the edge of their capabilities. Let's put it And that it way. looks, but it looks so good and you just hit the crowd be like, ooh, ooh, that was so sexy, Roger. How uh, this? Yeah. <laughs> I would put it in the same category or similar category, maybe not the same category. It's like there was a, a behind the scenes video from, um, well, you know, Rafa Nadal and Casper Ruder on tour at the moment. I think they're supporting the Rolling Stones. Um, and uh, there was a video of them behind the scenes, like doing a few keepy ups and sort of playing tech ball, you know, which is that game when you like volley the ball onto a little um, trampoline in the middle. But doing that yeah, with like a, a little football and a table. What's that? I thought it was called spike ball, or is that are they, is there a different oh, game? Maybe tech balls like table tennis. Anyway, point is they were doing some keepy ups and bouncing off a table, and lots of like, oh my god, this is amazing. But I think people forget that a like all tennis players have great hand eye, and b most tennis players are pretty good footballers, but because of that, like I, Calvin, I don't know, maybe I'm exaggerating, but I would imagine most tennis players are at some level pretty decent footballers. Yeah, well, look, it's it's not just that. It's most people who are good at one sport are good at most sports. 
Mm. Uh, that's ge that generally is the way that it's always been, right? From since uh, since schools, isn't it? You know, I'm sure everyone who's listening to this, whoever was the best player at football at school, also used to win the the hundred meter sprint at sports day, and they mm. probably won the long jump as well, uh, and and probably also won the long distance race. You know, that mm. that's the way that it that it always is. So it's no surprise, and like you know, especially in the countries where you know football is huge, like in Spain. It's it's absolutely no surprise at all that Rafa Nadal has probably played a lot of football. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And Roberto Batista Agut, uh, very nearly played for Villarreal. Yeah, he played football to a very high level. I mean, I'm sure there are lots of stories of that, as you say, but that's just one of the ones that I know. Um, anyway, we've been sort of dragged screamingly off topic, but uh, I don't think that's always always the worst thing in the world. Um, Nick Bollettieri, it'd be great if anyone else has similar kind of stories about Nick Bollettieri or um, anything like that. Then please do let us know. You can drop us an email. Um, love tennis pod at gmail.com George I'm, I'm in the middle of a thing and you've got something sorry to say. I, I did just want to say I was really laughing at that quote this week about him talking about his string of wives and that one of them had <laughs> threatened to him it's me or Agassi and he says he started packing his things immediately <laughs> <laughs> I just thought that was you know you know he always spoke about that kind of challenge on a more serious note of like living a normal life versus being kind of involved in tennis which is such an all-consuming thing at whatever whatever level you live you know whether you're kind of a journalist on the tour whether you're a coach whether you're a player you know it it never bloody stops this thing and it really can affect your personal life so i just i find that quite an amusing way i of... found it um I, I found myself on the way to work uh, <laughs> yesterday uh, thinking when i was driving in about this nine wives thing and I, I started wondering like at what's how many wives down the line is it where when you ask the next one to marry you whether they're thinking i don't know if this is a good idea <laughs> you know, it's like, like you know when you've been you know the ninth one you know surely she knows he's been married eight times <laughs> this, this might not be a great shout i think there's another great quote room where i think it was seven just to, to fact yeah, yeah, yeah. well this is what i was gonna say so there's didn't he marry think... two twice or something yeah, so there's, there's something on there's someone called sporting intel nick harris i think he uh yeah. tweeted yeah, about this and he said He's um, he was married seven times. Um, he also says there were two others, but they didn't last a week, so he doesn't count them. But he's not <laughs> right. sure if that's true or not. So. Right. Okay. <laughs> there yeah. is like it's between seven and nine. I apparently. mean, Nick, Nick Harris also knew Nick Bolteri very well. Um, because he wrote his column, he ghosted his column for the Mail on Sunday for a, a number of years. So, yeah, if he doesn't know, I'm not sure anyone does. But yes. Um, a man of many wives and um, many tennis lessons. Uh, I would love to hear if you had a tennis lesson with Nick Bollettieri. You can send us an email, lovetennispod at gmail.com. Uh, drop us a DM on Twitter, oh. at lovetennispod. Uh, or leave us a five-star review and include your anecdote in that, because that always goes down well and guarantees that I will read it out. We've had a couple of emails, and because we're kind of running out of time in the first half, I thought I might include them here. Um, I've had a question from Tim Not Henman who says, uh, Hi, love tennis pod team. Love the show as ever, and also happy Christmas. Thank you, Tim. A little early, but uh, we will acknowledge that it is indeed December. Uh, a while ago, Tim of Henman Hill fame was commentating and said that Federer had six... Uh, Roger Federer, that is, I assume, had six out of ten volleys. Now, at the time, people thought that was harsh. Do you agree? I know your love for Johnny Mack. Would he be a ten out of ten? Is Dan Evans a four and Maxime Cressim a three? Who's the best volleyer out there at the moment? Um, Calvin, it seemed like the uh, the right man to ask about this. Six out of um, ten, Federer volleying. Zverev's a zero in Calvin's book. <laughs> well, it's, I mean, in any way. Go to minuses. Zverev <laughs> <laughs> would be like, better off letting anything bounce, to be honest. <laughs> um, um, I, I, I don't know if a six is fair, but what I will say is I agree that Federer's volleys are overrated. He's not a great volleyer by any mm. stretch. Uh, um, and I had, a, I had a conversation with um, a player at a top top 100 player maybe about a year ago discussing this exact thing and I said that I didn't think Federer at the time was in the must have been more than that because he was when Federer was still playing regularly I didn't think he was in the 10 best volleys in the world he's certainly not in the 10 best, best volleys of all time um, I wouldn't say he's close to that um, so in terms of overall in terms of like of all time volleyers I'd say he's probably he's about right with a 6 out of 10 mm. um, in terms of you know players in the last Three, four years, probably he's probably a little bit better than that. To be fair, um, I know I'm pretty sure you think John McEnroe is a ten out of ten volleyer. McEnroe is um, the best volleyer of all time. It's either him or Stefan Edberg. Right. Um, 
who then is the best volleyer at the moment? Um, I think Dimitrov is a very good volleyer. Um, Interesting. I'd say Andy Murray was a, a, a excellent volleyer. He's gone off a bit, to be fair, and not volleyed so well since he's come back from his surgery, which is very strange. Bad, you, yeah, but you wouldn't think it was, um, you know, something that would affect him so much. But um, it, it, there's different types of volleyers. This is the thing, and there's different types of technique. Like, I mean, you get stuff like people saying that Nadal's the best volleyer in the world because you never see him miss one, and it's people used to best say the same about. As people say the same about Agassi. The thing is with Nadal and Agassi, they came in they they were the best decision makers when to come in the net, but you'd hardly ever see them play low volleys. Um they basically the best in the world at chopping them off. Um but um Humbert was a good Humbert's a good one, although he's dropped down terribly. Dan Evans is an excellent volleyer. Like that, that four out of ten was harsh in the Oh uh, yeah, he's way question. better than four out of ten. <laughs> um way better. Just another name for the Knicks, just an annoy Calvin, but someone who does out, have outrageous hands is Kyrgios. Uh, very, yeah, but again, the, this is what I said that what I, was, what I was trying to get onto there. There's basically two types of volleyers. You get the real, the technical volleyers, like Tim Hemman was a real technical volleyer. Ed Berg was a real technical volleyer. And then you get the guys who are more about hands, like McEnroe was, McEnroe didn't do anything textbook. Um and basically, it was all about his hands. Kyrgios is a lot like that. Pat Rafter was all a bit like that as well. Pat Rafter was a fantastic volleyer, but completely different volleyer than Henman, who they were around at the same era. But you wouldn't. This is again where we get into this idea of technique. Which one of Henman and Rafter has the better technique? Because they're both different and they're both brilliant volleyers. Interesting stuff. Um... I have a second question, which maybe you can answer in a brief answer, Calvin. Also from uh, Tim. Uh, he says, I'm an OK county player looking to improve. Are there any good mental te- training books outside of tennis, the inner game and winning ugly? Um, there are. If um, if Tim would like to uh, direct message me on Twitter, I'll respond to him because I don't have the names of them off by hand, but I can find out. But I've read two or three really good ones. We can put them in the Twitter feed as a response to the pod. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And I will, I could, or I could put them in the description, uh, or I could even drop Tim and he, we could even email you back, Tim. Is inflation taking a bite out of your grocery budget? Andrews Federal Credit Union is here to help. Introducing our Inflation Buster Share Certificate with five percent APY for seven months now through December fourteenth. Bring your money to Andrews Federal Credit Union today. The Inflation Buster account must be open with new money. Andrews Federal Credit Union membership is not just for the military. We also serve the community. Visit andrewsfcu.org. Federally insured by NCUA. Membership eligibility required. APY equals annual percentage yield. Must have a $1,000 minimum balance to earn advertised APY. Sports Social. Now on the Sports Social Podcast Network. Hello, I'm Ashley Blaker, and I'm hosting a new season of the comedy panel show, Never Write Off the Germans, in partnership with my diesel claim. Join me and my esteemed comedy guests as we discuss all that's ridiculous with the greatest show on earth for this winter in a host nation with domestic football equivalent to the Isthmian League South. We'll guide you through the tournament covering everything that's funny with the countries taking part. Whether you're a diehard fan or an occasional bandwagon jumper, you're supporting your home nation until they're embarrassingly knocked out by Iran. Listen on the Sports Social Podcast Network or wherever you get your podcasts. But remember, never write off the Germans. Here at the famous Sloping Pitch Podcast, we're following the greatest show on earth. But would you like pitch side seats for all the action in Qatar? The heat, the goals, the drama? Well, so would we. But why not join me, Nick Hancock, in Stoke on Trent and co host Chris England in London's SW16? Every game live from England. The famous Sloping Pitch Podcast. We think this tournament could be okay. Sport Social. Sports Social Podcast Network. Join me, David Seaman, every week on my podcast, Seaman Says. We'll have all the reaction to the biggest matches and I chat to some of my former England teammates like Gary Lineker. You always seem to score I, past me. I want to thank you for enhancing my career. <laughs> <laughs> and current stars like Aaron Ramsdale. Was David a diva? Um, <laughs> David I had his own dressing room. And Yay! Yeah. Listen to Seaman Says right now, wherever you get your podcasts. I'll see you soon. Right, moving on, uh, we've had some bad news for the LTA today, some hard news uh, for the LTA. They've been threatened with expulsion from the uh, ATP over their decision to ban 
Russian and Belarusian players from British events last year. Uh, they've now been fined a total of $2 million uh, by the ATP and WTA combined. Or they've been fined $1.75 million, I should say, and there's another 250 in there for the All England Club who own the licence for Birmingham. The LTA statement said, uh, we're deeply disappointed with this outcome. The ATP, in its finding, has shown no recognition of the exceptional circumstances created by Russia's invasion of Ukraine or the international sporting community and the UK government's response to that invasion. The ATP appear to regard this matter as a straightforward breach of rules with a surprising lack of empathy shown for the situation in Ukraine and a clear lack of understanding of the unique circumstances the LTA faced. Uh, the ATP put out a statement a few hours later. They said, We stand by our original position on this matter, that unilateral decision-making by members of the ATP Tour threatens our ability to operate as a global sport. We believe that the measures taken to protect the long-term future of our game and its commitment to merit-based participation without discrimination for individual athletes. Um, this is, and I hesitate to use the phrase, a war of words, given the context of an actual war going on, but that is what we would use to describe it in any other circumstances. Um, George, it's no coincidence that the ATP have settled on $1 million, um, which is the same number, of course, that the WTA settled on, albeit by different maths. This is another sort of attempt to create a united front in, in what is a kind of, I mean, a pretty huge spat, to be honest. Yeah, I mean... It's funny, isn't it? I always think, kind of like thinking about when we were first kind of debating this issue as a whole, like a lot of what we said at the time, you know, probably me and James were on the fence, but veering towards the pro side of the decision. But we did kind of say, you know, make, make sure you're kind of making the decision together and getting other people like on board if you're going to do this. And that really never happened. And they've been left kind of stood out there. <laughs> And now it's kind of hard to think Calvin wasn't totally right in the first place, which is sometimes... Oh, I don't like about hearing most, that. I think we can things. avoid that kind of phrase. Yeah, I know. I, I do hate to say it because quite often I have opinions on tennis and I hear Calvin say something and I was like, oh God, wasn't I wrong about that? He's actually looking at this at a very good level and I'm um, like, slightly embarrassed I thought that. Although I will defend Shapovalov's uh, backhand to the hilt for its beauty. But anyway, well, let's not get straight into that territory. But... It, it, it is just a disaster. And I think the thing that, you know, even when we were commentating on it at the time, the thing that I've been worried about and have been worried about in British tennis for a while now, given certain figures who have left and certain figures who have come in in certain high priority positions, is their ability to communicate with the rest of the tennis world and their ability to kind of have quite open, honest, but like civil conversations around things rather than just like, we're going to make this decision unilaterally and because we're Wimbledon and because we're British and because et cetera, et cetera. And we're going to align with things we want to do without much consideration. I, I, I really hope this whole episode is going to serve as a bit of a lesson to Wimbledon specifically, but also to British tennis as a whole, that you get a lot further in the world with a bit more collaboration and honest conversation rather than rushing to big decisions you know, bear in mind, they came in quite early on that decision and they wanted to make a strong statement. But as the decision came closer and closer, it felt weaker and weaker because of events that were going on around it. And I, you know, that's a tennis problem full stop that people don't speak to each other enough. But Wimbledon and occasionally LTA do act quite strongly sometimes without that really collaborative feel. So I think that's probably a big takeaway, regardless of how this does pan out. And, and I think, George, you're right, of course, and communication. I think generally communication at the highest level is okay. I think, you know, there are protocols set up and, um, you know, the Grand Slam board creates a bit of give and take. And certainly since maybe the beginning of the pandemic and, you know, the French Open making that pretty unilateral decision just that yeah. they didn't really tell anyone about that was particularly bad when they moved the calendar without telling anyone. But I've spoken to quite a lot of people today. My, I barely put down the phone. And I had it repeated to me again, something that I got told when I was in Paris earlier this year, which was someone extremely well placed saying, we've stopped telling them what we're going to do because it always leaks. Now, I won't say which side of the um, the fence that came from, but it, it's not really relevant. It, it kind of highlights the breakdown in trust 
that has you know these these places Wimbledon especially is the home of like controlled marketing you know their brand is so prestigious that everything they do needs to look really organized and on point so they are in the habit of telling people lots of things in advance and they and they and lots of other people now find themselves unable to talk to each other in advance of things happening because they don't trust each other anymore yeah and i think that 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 point about control is really pertinent because there's I think it's easy to forget there was quite a big shift in leadership in terms of, you know, you had the Philip Brook years that were pretty well um, and Richard Lewis as well, who was, you know, a very, very good organiser of a tournament and kind of the day-to-day operations. And Philip Brook, you know, love him or hate him and what was going around it, you know, there was a very orchestrated plan that they were doing with Wimbledon. And, it, you know, you heard all sorts of rumours about how that, passing on was going and there's been big issues kind of sorting out the site and dealing with locals etc that control has really slipped away and it's no coincidence that some of the stalwarts who were there before aren't there and it does change when these things happen you have different faces different people coming in maybe not understanding you know the wider face of tennis or the landscape um so yeah I, i think there there probably will be a lot of inward looking at wimbledon and it does sound like there are kind of political move maneuverings happening there you know i'll signpost you to a piece from simon briggs the other week where he did a bit of a kind of deep dive into some of that kind of political shifting in behind the scenes it was a really interesting piece and you know you, you get that sense that th- this decision has had a big knock-on effect inside the grounds as it has done outside and yeah, hopefully it gets to a stage where it's all brushed under the carpet to a degree and they find a way to take it forward. But, you know, this this kind of ongoing to and fro it, it is not very pretty for anyone and they do need to really kind of sort it out. And, you know, Calvin, I'm, not to bring you in here, but, you know, you put a tweet out earlier where you were criticising how it's always the people at, at the bottom who pay for a lot of these decisions and, lo- you know, there's a threat of losing challenger events or whatever in 2023, you know. It always falls on the worst people in these events. You know, nothing's going to actually happen to Wimbledon. We know that's going to be a great event that goes on. It's always the kind of ecosystem that suffers as a result of this. Well, I mean, it's not. Even, I mean, I, I, to 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 kind of follow up on that, George. It's not even. This isn't a threat. Like I, I have been told today from again another very well placed source that there were due to be two challenger events indoors in the UK in the first quarter of 2023, and they now will not happen. Because no. these events are run at a loss by the LTA, um, that that is their kind of raison d'être to spend money on British tennis. They're not a profit-making organisation. Their job is to spend the money that Wimbledon makes, and they will not run those events because it threatens their finances. A to be fined what looks like up to two million dollars and the threat of future fines. I will just say on that point that they definitely do have the finances to still run that event. And they still should run those events. Like this, this is like a typical, typical poor business making decision where they're pretending this is a knock on effect. Like that is also poor decision making from the LTA. It's, it's nonsense. But they will probably follow through on it because you know it's an, yep. an easy piece of grandstanding to make. And Calvin, you know as as well as anyone, probably better than anyone, that this is going to hurt people who don't deserve to be hurt. Um. Yeah. It's. I mean, it really is such a mess. It, it really is. And I don't know the full story for how it came about. I do have a little bit of sympathy with the LTA because I think they were the third on the sort of food chain of what decided it. Obviously, the British government uh, flexed their muscles and then Wimbledon, the All England Club itself, I think, as far as I'm told, made the, the ultimate decision or, or that the government and the people at Wimbledon, who I think were in cahoots on it, mm. made the ultimate decision on it. But, of course, the tournament is run through the LTA, so the LTA had to fall in line with it. Um, I want to know why Wimbledon's not paying it. They made a fortune this year. Why are they just not stepping up and going, right, we'll just pay it? Why does the LTA have to pay it? Why do Why do tennis players have to miss out on tournaments this year? Wimbledon makes a fortune every year. It was their decision. If they didn't want to do it, why aren't they doing it? And, again, I'll come back to it. What's going to happen this year? Are we just going to keep paying a million dollars every single year just to carry on this nonsense of no ranking points well i mean just to kind of step in on that if i may um the i've again been told today that the atp as the wta did when they made their decision in july the atp have said if you do it again well we might have to kick you out 
and you know no one has put that on the record because it's again i forgive me for the language it's a nuclear option but that is being tabled and it is because the atp see this as an existential threat which you know this is the thin end of a pretty punchy wedge and it's not that thin so i can understand what they're saying but yeah calvin as you say it, it creates a lot of questions for people in positions of power george yeah I, you know I, i've given calvin his credit for hindsight but i'm also going to give myself credit because <laughs> i don't know if you remember at the time you probably wouldn't because it was quite a boring comment but the thing i said at the time was it's one thing wimbledon making this decision it's another one the lta going along with it and they don't have the resources wimbledon do and picking a fight with the tours is a lot harder for the lta and their british events around it because they're not Wimbledon. They do run at losses, a lot of these things. And, you know, potentially losing Queens as a Masters event, potentially having fallout on all these other events in the calendar. You know, as Calvin says, it's hard to know the exact ins and outs, the politics of this decision. But from my perspective, as I said at the time, they should not have got involved in it. They should have stuck with the ACP WTA line. That's what they should have been doing. I think it was a really grave error from the LTA to cross that divide because I don't actually believe it should have been the same from Wimbledon to everything else. Wimbledon's a kind of private club event. Everything else can fall in line with the tours and say, look, we're taking this approach with the rest of the tour. We're doing this, this and this. We're going to speak to our other tournaments that are running in similar periods of the calendar, have those honest open conversations. They should not have jumped into bed with this decision as early. As Calvin says, you know, if it is the case that Wimbledon was saying, you have to come along with us with it, then they should bloody well pay it because, frankly, it was a ludicrous decision from the LTA to jump into this decision, as I did say at the time, and I will stick with that Captain Hindsight moment, even though it was Foresight. <laughs> well, Captain Foresight um, <laughs> has been proven to be one thing or the other, but I, I think what I find most interesting about this, and look, I'm by no means the most well-connected journalist um, in most rooms, but I've spoken to a lot of different people who have tangentially or directly or in various different capacities been involved in this process all the way through and i've yet to really find anyone who was involved with it who has accepted that they might have got it wrong like i haven't really ever heard anyone say god yeah i mean it was the right decision at the time maybe but i don't know about now and and that's what kind of concerns me because the the, L, the the All England Club and the LTA who say they make this decision jointly and who are we to argue although if you can't work out who wears the trousers in that relationship then I think you know, you're know you not looking in the right place um, but they are going to have to make this decision again you know in the next well I think they will make it in the next three months and they keep saying oh well you know things can change so we're not going to make that decision now I think they think the war might end. And it's like, well, the war isn't going to end. There isn't going to be a ceasefire. You're hoping against hope there is. The reality is you're going to have to make one of two very difficult decisions. You're either going to, frankly, turn British tennis into the pariah you want to turn Russian sport into by getting them kicked out of the tours and making them an island somewhat um, analogous with our own national situation, quite frankly, or you're going to have to make a climb down and a U-turn and say, well, what they will say if they do it is, we didn't get it wrong last year, but we think things are different now. And I don't know which of the two they're more capable of. Yeah, well, you know, this this was Calvin's argument last year about the kind of, you know, what are you going to do oh, if it goes God, on and Calvin on and on. Was right again. <laughs> but, but equally, what I would say is, I have sympathy in the sense that I, I don't think it was a black and white decision at the time. Like, I do think I was genuinely like, I could do this, could do this, and can see both sides of it and probably slightly lent towards what they did at the moment they made it. As the tournament got closer, I was shifting the other way. But I can understand that position. I, I would genuinely struggle for them to make that position right now in the context of the tennis world, not in terms of the war, but like knowing what the rest of the world is doing and how they're treating it. At the time, it was quite uncertain. And while they could have done a lot more kind of canvassing and bringing people along on board either way, having those conversations rather than doing this big decision-making thing, I had more sympathy at that stage because, you know, it's 
to a degree, it is harder when these things are newer. You know, they're more in the media all the time. It's on the front of everyone's faces. Like that was a very, very, very difficult decision, I felt. And it is, still is a horrible thing. But it, you know, as we know in the news industry, things do slightly fade from the kind of public conscience. Mm -hmm. And it becomes an easier decision to make for a sporting event than it was in that moment where it was everywhere i know that's not how you should make moral decisions but that that's, oh, that's the, the reality of the reality. situation yeah yeah absolutely it's called cool. i mean it's called distancing criminal lawyers use it all the time where if they want to take someone in a high profile case to trial and whether they're going to plead guilty or not guilty they will do their very best to make sure that trial does not happen for a couple of years because juries soften to the idea and they know that and they know that things get and as you say george it's not a pleasant reality it is just a marketing and communications reality um calvin I, I'm, I'm sorry i think i cut you off did, did you have more you wanted to say on it um not really no just um as i said in my tweet it, it's uh, the it's just a shame that the the players will end up paying for this in one way or another mm. whether that be bonus scheme gets reduced uh, we have less tournaments um whether we have, uh, you know, the performance budget gets cut, it will be players that pay for it. It won't be anybody at the All England Club that pays for it. I know that much. It won't be whoever the blooming hell was foreign secretary when the decision was made. I mean, it was Jesus. Probably about Nadine Dorries was ago. culture secretary, oh. and I believe she well, was pretty. Well, Kelsa Priest. Yeah, it won't be anyone like that. You know, like I said, the, there's no question. The All England Club should pay it. They, the government put the pressure on them. Um, they've got loads of money that they will spend on rubbish um, so they should pay it, the LTA shouldn't have to pay it but as George alluded to, the LTA, it's a strange one again, I you know, I, I don't think people understand, a lot of people don't understand this, how the relationship with the LTA and Wimbledon the tournament is run by the LTA at the All England Club, it's the only one of the Grand Slams that runs like that the other three Grand Slams are run by the governing bodies at their own centres. Um, whereas the 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 difference is that the All England Club is a separate entity. It's a club. The LTA could uh, decide if they wanted that it would no longer be held at Wimbledon and build their own centre and run it there. It, then Wimbledon wouldn't have any power to run a Grand Slam. Is that but, right? Yeah, it is right. Yeah, I'm basically. Not sure I yeah, if the LTA, because there's always this idea that people always go all the time. You hear people all the time, well, the LTA would be knackered if Wimbledon decided to take that 24 million or X amount of million a year away from them. That would never happen because if the All England Club decided to do that, then the LTA would go, okay, we'll no longer have the tournament there. We'll build our own place to hold it. And they wouldn't be. It's basically like if you think about it, it's the, it's the British Open. It's not Wimbledon. It's the British Open that's the tournament. The LTA at any stage could decide to take it away but it, it's a mutual beneficial for both parties it will never happen that's the LTA will the Wim, Wimbledon will the All England Club will never take away the money that they give the LTA for that reason and the LTA will never uh, build their own centre for that reason as well the the one thing I would say that I, I am saying slightly tongue in cheek but also just in the context of stuff like golf you know we're saying that the people at the higher power won't pay for it but when you've got a player faction itching for a Grand Slam to move somewhere that pays them a lot more money and you've got one of the Grand Slams feuding with the tour and potentially you know, not having prize money and points, etc. and not allowing certain players to go in, I, I really would not advise opening that door as Wimbledon. Like, genuinely would not advise that because we'll be talking about Doha done or something very soon that, you know... It is very tongue in cheek, but also, you know, in the wider sporting landscape, I, I wouldn't, I, I'd probably find a way to resolve this quite quickly from a Wimbledon perspective. Um, we're going to move on. Uh, it's a fascinating story. It, I'm sure we'll hear more about it because, as I say, the All England Club have a decision to make. Uh, they either have to climb down or they have to double down, and both will have pretty significant um impact on all sorts of things but we can move on and we can talk about the hopman cup everyone's favorite team tournament which i think we all thought was dead i think we thought but as i believe they say in game of thrones that which is dead cannot die uh, and the <laughs> hopman cup has not died uh it's the itf's official mixed team competition which you'll all remember for 
that Federer Serena moment that everyone bangs on about so much and forgets about all the other quite forgettable tennis that went on there. Um, it will return for the 2023 season. It's going to be operated by Tenium, who are a company who also own and run a couple of other tennis tournaments, notably the Barcelona Open, the European Open in Antwerp, and a couple of others. Um, they're very experienced, to say the least, when it comes to running tennis tournaments. Um, it's going to run from the 19th to the 23rd of July uh, in Nice on clay as what I think should be known as the Clare Swing because it's usually Bastard, Gestard, Tustard and now Hopman Stard. Um, it, it's, <laughs> it's going to be the same format as far as I know. It's going to be run after Wimbledon in that weird clay court swing. I mean, George, it's the tournament everyone's been crying out for, isn't it? Absolutely. absolutely. When you said it's in Nice, is it at Moritoglu's Academy? No, 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 it's at the <laughs> Nice Lawn Tennis Club. <laughs> Sorry, I was just thinking, oh, that would, that would be classic. Um, I, my, heck, it might be a gateway drug to the Moritoglu Academy, I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, I was surprised. I, I'm not necessarily like 100% against it, but I kind of felt like the United Cup was the the place we needed the Hotman Cup to go to in terms of uniting the two tours, offering some points, you know, good prize money, a bit more towards serious build-up to an event. Um, you know, I enjoyed the Hotman Cup for, for what it was, but I, I'm kind of hoping the United Cup will be... <laughs> a lot better because it will attract very top players all the time. Whereas, you know, the Federer Serena thing was, you know, Federer used to go and play it all the time, don't get me wrong, but that that particular crossover that you'd love about it happened once in 10 years that I can remember of the Hotman Cup. I, I can't remember how long the Hotman Cup was going on for, but it was never that newsworthy. And that was like, a, as you say, kind of a, a thing everyone talks about, but it, it wasn't happening every year. The United Cup potentially has the potential to link people up although you might suggest they've missed the boat now you've lost roger and serena because they're probably the top two stars that would work with um but yeah i i'm i'm not i'm not against good mixed events thriving within the tour because it's a format that people like to play as at club level it does create different stories i've always said one of the thing that makes tennis so newsworthy is the ability to bring in so many different kind of cultural aspects and a lot of that is that you have very highly paid men and women and you have this kind of more representative version of society at the top level of elite sport that other sports kind of struggle to tap into so i think yeah in general mixed events are really good and i hope the hopman cups are success because i'd like to see more of them in a more kind of professionalized way rather than just you know a bit of banter at the grand slams occasionally it's hard to argue with, George. I do like the event. I really hate where, not where they're doing it. Although, do we really need more tennis in the south of France? Arguably, but I'm fine. Yeah, but... you'd love a trip there, though, wouldn't you? Can't you? Nice oh, don't like... get me wrong. If <laughs> if Tenium are listening and they'd like to, you know, just cover a little trip down to the south of France, we'll all come. We'll all yeah, come. Yeah, all three of us. We could be the official yeah. podcast of the Hotman Cup. Uh, there's also. Uh, <laughs> I mean, this is a slightly moot point, um, but the the Hotman Cup is named after, I believe, a famous Australian uh, Davis Cup captain. And I believe his widow used to attend the tournament until she sadly passed away in her 90s four years ago. And I think it's a bit weird now to have, like, this tournament that's named after a famous Australian who, with the greatest respect not many people outside of Australia have heard of and now they're holding it in the south of France um, and you know it just seems a bit strange to me I don't know um, Calvin do, do you like the, the look of it? No, no it's nonsense it won't be happening in five years time it'll fade away <laughs> it's a five year contract so that it will it, be right, five yeah, it years and, and done it, you reckon it won't carry on no, I mean it was the Hotman Cup was decent because it held for very specific reasons. Uh, the p position where it held in the calendar, it was kind of fell. It was an exhibition, but kind of felt always felt a little bit more than an exhibition for the reason that it was. And you know, you can't just put it anywhere in the calendar; it's just not going to work. Especially when there's something else now at the exact same time in the calendar 
which is the exact same format, which works, which now has ranking points as well. Mm. Like, it just won't work. And also, it's a big thing as well because I've, I've I've been to Perth where it used to be held, and it was a big thing because Perth is is of course famously the most uh, isolated major city in the world. So they got a bit of tennis. Uh, at a time when they they're not going to get any more, so the stadium was always full, and it was a big thing within the community of Perth. I've got family out there; they always went every day, every year. Mm. Um, so that that's it. Perth was a, a huge reason as to why it was such a success. And I don't think, like you say, it's just like why is it? You can't just have change it to the the Hopman Cup somewhere else. It's just a nonsense. So it's um, going to start three days after the Wimbledon final on clay. It's clashing with Bastad, Gestad, and the Hall of Fame Open in Newport, which I admit doesn't really make any sense. It doesn't make much of a difference. But if you're the person who plays that post-Wimbledon clay court swing, and, and there are people who do it, you know, I mean, we often talk about Casper Ruud doing it when he was making his way up the rankings, and there are a fair few guys who've had some success there. If you are the person who's going to do that, aren't you, like already pretty keyed in to play Bastard and Gestad anyway, or Bastard or Gestard anyway, like in competition with that particular week, is there any reason you'd rather play Hotman Cup? Unless no, I mean, gonna... they'll, they'll, they'll pay a load of money, but this is why it won't work. Cause they'll end up paying a fortune to get players there. They'll mm. end up overpaying to get players there. But I don't even know who's going to go. The players would rather have ranking points. Yeah. Like it's, it's just an exhibition. There's a reason why you don't have exhibitions bang in the middle of the season or exhibition tournaments bang in the middle of the season because it's bang in the middle of the season. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's quite hard to argue with that. Um, I'm going to bring in, speaking of exhibition tournaments, there is an exhibition tournament starting tomorrow. That uh, That is all I'm going to say about it. People know about it. We've talked about it a lot. It's in Saudi Arabia. Um, I've had an email from... Las Vegas, I seem to remember. Mr. Gustafson has sent us an email. He's not reminding me where he's from, but I'm fairly sure he's in Vegas. It says, total UK imports from Saudi Arabia amounted to 3.3 billion in the four quarters to the end of Q2 2022. If we all drive around fueled by Saudi oil, who are we to say that Cam Norrie can't drive around in a Ferrari paid for by Saudi oil? He's just collecting the money we gave them. So really, he is doing more than the rest. Of, is he doing more than the rest of us? Um, well, I don't drive, so uh, I don't drive around any cars fueled by Saudi oil, but I don't know which of you would like to have a go at um, disputing that point from Mr. Gustafson. George, you look like you're munching for a for a pop. Sorry, say again. What did you say? Um, well, he's pointing out, essentially, that we all drive around in cars full of Saudi oil or derivatives. I, I personally do. Um, well, no, I mean, neither do I. Yeah, but... I uh, well, you know what? The, the, I will make the point. I'm not here to give my opinions on this podcast, but sometimes mm. I end up having to. Um, I didn't make a deal with the Saudis. I haven't sold them any arms. I haven't bought any oil from them. Um, I personally don't do any business with the Saudi Arabian government, and neither does Cam Norrie until now. And I think, as Calvin said the other week, he has made a choice to go and do this business with the Saudi government in what is a marketing exercise. That's, that tennis tournament is not happening to develop tennis uh, around the world. It's not really happening to develop tennis in Saudi Arabia. It is happening as a marketing move and a sports washing move for the Saudi Arabian government. I'll, I'll go into it. I'll answer it. Um, I drive. I have to drive for work. I have to drive because it's 2022 and that's the way that we live, right? If I don't know where the petrol comes from, where I get my petrol from, but let's say if it was Saudi Arabia and the, and I had the choice of getting it from a different petrol station that wasn't Saudi Arabia, I'd go there. I'd make the choice not to do business with Saudi Arabia. I wouldn't, I'm not actively making choice. I'm not going, right, I'm now going to go and I'm not bank transferring 30 pounds into the saudi arabian government every time i do it yeah i get that it goes somewhere there and it down the line it happens but it's not a choice i'm making do, do is the choice that i'm is is i forget his name tim is it philip this is philip philip, philip if if philip is, is, is philip suggesting that we just don't use any petrol ever you know so we just live like uh mormons 
shall we? Um, or Amish people. <laughs> I was going to say, like, Mormons, I think they're okay with yeah, that. Yeah, it's <laughs> Amish people then. Correct. Like, it just doesn't, you know, and I've, it's not Philip and his own that's doing it. This All this stuff came up when Newcastle were buying, um, were, when the Saudis were buying Newcastle. Oh, well, you know, everyone's claiming about Newcastle, but, you know, they have a, they have a 0.0% input into Disney and people still watch Disney films. Like it's just, I'm just not buying it. Like I said, if there was not, if I had that option of getting my petrol somewhere else, I would do. But I don't. They don't list the countries where they're selling the petrol from on petrol stations. Thank you very much, Calvin. Again, as I seem to keep saying this, I don't like all this agreeing with each other, lads. Mm -hmm. Calvin keeps you need to disagree right. at some yeah. point. Maybe uh, next week. Yeah. We've got the awards. <laughs> We should do the awards properly uh, next. Yes, week, yeah, we can disagree we'll, on that from right. Yeah, yeah, there'll be some. Because I, well. I won't be voting for Calvin as coach of the year. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was the private. That was the that was that was the the private awards. Also, I can't believe Calvin didn't make the shortlist. To be honest, <laughs> like um, genuinely speaking, show me a coach with a better record this year. Don't think there is one. <laughs> we, we we this is too much, George. Calvin's head's going to explode. <laughs> um, it, it, as and actually, since we're doing the big Calvin stuff, Calvin went viral this week. Um, I'm going to read out a quote and you can tell me if it's A, Shakespeare, B, Shelley or C, Calvin. Uh, it's, I've watched football matches in grounds and pubs for 35 years. Actual football fans don't celebrate goals like this. People in pubs didn't either up until about four years ago. It's very, very odd. Um, Calvin Agbong Lahore, the celebration police checking in for duty. Um, I, I, Calvin, how many how many likes are we up to? Are we passed twelve thousand now. I knew it after about two hours. So it, it infuriates me that I come up with some really good content on Twitter and it does zero numbers, and then just this weird rant that I made at eleven o'clock at night. Um, <laughs> as did did like woke up the next morning, and I had forty eight notifications or something. I think it's I think it's up above twenty thousand likes now. Good lord, um, you're right. People didn't celebrate like this until four years ago. Chucking beer up and down. Um, after scoring the third goal against Senegal, doesn't seem doesn't seem right. Um, let's move on. I don't want to give that any more attention than it has already had. Uh, Fernando Vadasco has been banned for two months. Um, he's accepted a ban. That's the technical term for these things uh, because he forgot to renew a therapeutic use exemption for his ADHD medication and tested positive for metal methylphenidate. I believe it's called. Um, his provincial suspension ends January the 8th, 2023, which means he could still play the Australian Open quite comfortably. Um, this has created some stramash, to say the least, online. Riley Apelka, a man who we've rarely heard from, says one of the biggest issues in tennis, why are guys taking Adderall for the first time in their life as adults? Legal doping. Sorry, but I don't have any empathy for a tennis player testing positive for Adderall, as in my mind, it's a PED. Uh, Pam Shriver says through great rounds of pro tennis I hear that many players are on ADHD meds which is sort of Trumpian phrasing I hear that many players many players I hear many players um, <laughs> to help sharpen focus and concentration in a manner that brings up integrity questions are ADHD meds the meldonium for the brain remember that wonder how many current players have asked for a TUE for ADHD recently um, I'm going to give you a yes or no question Calvin that's going to avoid any legal issues <laughs> Do, do you know any players who have TUEs for ADHD medication? Uh, no, I don't know any players who have any TUEs at all, I don't think. But maybe they just wouldn't tell me. <laughs> George? I, I'm going to say this in very kind of loose terms, avoiding the um, the legal Specific. ramifications. But it, it was got. I don't know if you remember that group. Was it the Fancy Bears, the Russian hackers yes. at one time? And they had a big thing around TUEs at that point, didn't they, where they were kind of naming athletes from all sorts of sports around this kind of thing and kind of flagging I suppose to a degree this issue of Pelka and others are talking about about the high level of um, frequency with which you know high performing athletes of whom you kind of almost assume would have perfect bodies and you know mm. no issues uh, do seem to have kind of a fairly surprisingly high rate of um, Asthma reliance on TVs. I think that's all I will say on that. But it, it, it's an interesting discussion. I'm not saying I, I don't want to question the validity of anyone, and you know, it's a really challenging topic. And uh, you know, the fact they're putting them as TUEs at least suggests they've gone through medical channels. But I, it's always one of those things around sport where, unfortunately, we live in a world where people we think we should be able to trust in terms of signing things off. 
aren't always that trustworthy. I know we're then stepping in something, but I've kept incredibly beautifully vague, and that's how. Well, you just don't name anyone. I think that's fine. Yeah. Um, it, it is tough actually to talk about this and talk about what people want to talk about without libeling anyone. Um, I will say this much: TUEs have been abused in lots of sports by lots of people for a long time. Um, there are sports, and I'm not talking about Fernando Velasco in any way here. There are sports where an extraordinary number of people have asthma at the very highest level, at some in some form, and will be prescribed drugs to help with that and get a therapeutic use exemption to help with that. If you overclock your lungs, you can test positive for what show what what looks like asthma. And then you can get your therapeutic use prevention. If you have a doctor who is willing to comply, you can get a therapeutic use exemption. That has always been the method for a lot of different dopers. And as I say, I'm not saying Fernando Velasco is a doper because ADHD is something that people have and it's an effective um, treatment for it. But the problem is that lots of people have abused this system. So when you get a ban like this which is a rubbish ban because it covers basically its convenient length and just covers the off-season, it stimulates more distrust in the system, which is a very sad note to end a podcast on. (laughs) But um, I'm afraid that's the case. We're going to do our awards next week. Um, We will throw up some categories on Twitter in the next day or two. If you want more categories, stick them on the reply there or email us the usual way or DM us or whatever. Um, as always, most importantly, please come back and listen next week. Sports Social Podcast Network. This holiday season, I'm so happy I have my Honda Pilot. It's really helping me navigate all my holiday duties. Seriously. With room for eight, I can take my daughter and her friends to all their holiday parties and still have room for grandma's holiday decorations in the back. With an available Wi-Fi hotspot, I can do some shopping online, even on the go. This holiday season, get a great deal on the perfect Honda for you during Happy Honda Days. See your local Honda dealer today.